Hello, I'm Dave and this is Logan, out once again for a walk in the countryside. Thanks for joining us. Now today we're at the pretty village of Beer Regis in Dorset. It's situated about six miles northwest of Wareham and 11 miles east of Dorchester. And we're going to be walking a roughly three mile circular route. We'll have a wander through the village, then along the banks of the Beer Stream, south to Black Hill to try and find the Devil's Stone, past the watercress beds at Dodding's Farm and finish back at the Royal Oak Pub. Now I'm filming in uh, June, it is a glorious sunny day, blue sky, a little bit of a wind to keep us nice and cool, should be perfect conditions for walking, do come along with us. Well I've parked my car at a free car park in the centre of the village. It's a uh, quite a large village and uh, indeed it changed dramatically when the A35 bypass was built to the north in 1982. And it's got a lot of history as well. Edward I made the village a free borough and granted a royal charter. It had a market from 1215 up to the 1860s. And it's suffered quite a few fires through the ages, the 17th, 18th and 19th century in particular. So very few buildings are older than 1600. It gets its name from beer, old fashioned for grove or wood, and uh, Regis because of its early history when the village was part of the Crown Estate and when King John visited many times, more of him later. And Thomas Hardy, the poet and novelist, based the village of Kingsbeer in his 1891 novel, Tess of the Durbervilles, on Beer Regis. Indeed, Hardy's fictional family, the Durbervilles, were based on the real life family of the Turbervilles, who were lords of the manor here from the 13th to the 18th century. Well, before we have a little wander out into the countryside, let's have a look through the village. And we'll start off with the church, which uh, is just behind me here. St John the Baptist Church. Now, originally, there was a wooden Saxon church on the site, but the stone church started to be built in 1050, and it was largely rebuilt in the 12th century with enlargements in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, with a big restoration in 1875. And it's got a nave with five bays, the chancel, which was rebuilt in the 15th century. The North Isle and South Isles were both rebuilt in the 19th century. It's got a West Tower, which was added in 1500, and a South Porch, which was built in 1875. I think it's got six bells, and the oldest is dated 1602. OK, well, let's have a look inside. Gosh, look at these massive hooks above the door. Now, uh, those were iron hooks that were used for pulling down thatch on cottages when they caught fire. So I guess they uh, had quite a bit of usage in the past. Right, in we go. Now, usual story, folks. Very, very dark, so I'm going to put some photos up. But wow, some quite magnificent stained glass windows. And just here on my right, this is the South Chapel. This is the Turberville Chapel. Now, the Turbervilles uh, originally came from France at the time of the Norman Conquest. And as I said, uh, were lords of the manor here from the 13th century right up until the 18th century. Uh, just here on my left is uh, the font, which I believe is Norman, in, uh, just below the West Tower. Another stunning window. Now, just above me here in the roof, which is incredible, there's a whole load of carvings, carvings of the, the 12 disciples. There's six each side. See if I can identify any of them. There's uh, Peter with a cloak and mitre and keys. There's James with a big hat and a staff. He was the pilgrim. Matthew with a money bag in hand, he was a tax collector, and Philip with the loaf. And there's also a large central boss of a human face, and I think that's Cardinal Morton. Uh, he was a chancellor to Henry VII, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
And the, the rose and cord there represents his involvement of bringing about the marriage of Elizabeth of York and Henry VII after the Battle of Bosworth, so ending the War of the Roses. I say, it's a quite magnificent church. The organ here, and then the pulpit, and, well, a quite stunning stained glass window above the altar there. And again, tremendously well-constructed carved roof in the chancel. Wow. Okay, well, let's uh, pop outside and have a little look at the rest of the village. We're starting on the eastern side of the village. This is the Royal Oak Pub with origins back to 1614, but the present building dates from 1788. Apparently in the 18th century, there were something like seven pubs in the village. Well, just opposite the Royal Oak Pub is the bottom of North Street. A couple of interesting houses to look at. The one here, the corner store, in fact, it used to be a, a shop, and I have seen an old photo where it had a petrol pump outside it. Say, so just wandering along, it's a lovely little street. And then this building here, the Acorn, white uh, with thatch. And again, I've seen a photograph of this also with a, a petrol pump outside it. <laughs> and then just opposite the Acorn is uh, Beer Regis Village Hall, which uh, it was the Drax Hall. In fact, Henry Drax bought the estate in 1733. And just further on towards the end of North Street is the, uh, the home of Beer Regis Football Club, which was formed in 1885, and that makes them one of the oldest football teams in England. And this is the Drax Arms. There's been a pub here since the 17th century. Originally it was called the King's Arms and changed to the Drax in 1770. Oh, what a pretty little village Beer Regis is. I'm just about to cross the uh, stream, which is just behind me here. It's about 10 and a half miles long and its source is at Hilton, just northwest of Milton Abbas, and it joins the River Piddle just south of here, which then flows into Pool Harbour at Wareham. I think it may have been called the Milbourne Brook in the past. Uh, I know it does go through Milbourne St Andrew. Well, a bit early in the walk for a, a dog dip, but nice to cool down and have a little bit of fresh water. That looks very relaxing because it is about well, 18, 19 degrees already and it's projected to go up to 22 later on. <laughs> now that is a really good stream for a dog dip. just on the uh, southern side of Beer Stream and we're going to head westwards, I uh, say, to visit a little settlement with a slightly unusual name. So we're going to go through a meadow with buttercups. Looks like there's some sort of beacon here as well. On this little part of the walk uh, we're asked to keep uh, dogs on a lead. Now, folks, important message coming up. Just about to uh, pop into a little settlement to the west of uh, Beer Regis. And I apologise now if I start saying some words that may appear rude. And I hope you're not offended, but it's all genuine stuff. I just hope I don't get banned from YouTube. Anyway, you'll uh, get the drift as I uh, continue onwards. So, we're just about to enter the little settlement of... Shitterton, and it is the most delightful little place. And so it's to the west of Beer Regis, and because it was cut off by the Beer Stream, it seems to have 
been protected from the fires that afflicted the main village. And the name, well, it means farmstead on the stream used as an open sewer. So why such an unusual name? <laughs> In fact, it was voted Britain's worst place name by the uh, genealogy website Find My Place in 2012. Uh, second place, by the way, was Scratchy Bottom in Dorset. And third place was, and I kid you not, a place called Break My Wind in Aberdeenshire. And here's the beer stream again. Now, Shitterton was recorded in the Doomsday Book as Scatterer or Sketra, which is the Norman French rendering of the Old English name derived from uh, skite, meaning dung. And this became uh, shite in Middle English up to the 15th century. And, and I apologise for this, folks, shit <laughs> in Modern English. But the stream appears to be known as the <coughs> Shitter, or brook used as a privy. Anyway, during the 19th century, Victorians tried to rename it Citizen, and I see there is a house here called Citizen House. But apparently the hamlet sign was constantly being stolen, so in 2010, the inhabitants got together and bought a one and a half ton block of Portland stone, and it hasn't been nicked since. Right, we shall leave the uh, sign and uh, start heading southwards back over the stream again and uh, into the countryside. Oh, just what a delightful little old village pump, presumably, on the side there. Isn't that lovely? I've met that rather enchanting little village and we're now heading southwards. Now next to me here is an area of land known as Maze Wood. Back in 2012, Brian May of Queen, or should I say Dr. Brian May CBE, bought about 157 acres or so of land with the intention of creating an ancient woodland and a haven for wildlife. But it does uh, seem to be fenced off and looks as though uh, there's a padlock on the gate, so it doesn't look as though we can actually go in. But the locals were pleased as the land was in danger of being a large residential development and the area was divided up into eight fields with different types of trees in each, oak, beech, etc. And they started the planting in 2013 and I, I think the plan was to have something like a hundred thousand trees here eventually. small section of the Jubilee Trail which is that 90 mile long distance path that goes from Ford Abbey in Somerset to Bockley Dyke on the Hampshire Dorset border. It was created in 1995 to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of the Ramblers Association. Well, it's a shame that we can't uh, go inside Mayswood but I saw a sign that uh, suggested that uh, they might have had issues with out of control dogs uh, with wildlife so it's uh, understandable. Well, a little update on the route, in case folk might be doing this walk after seeing the video. We're heading towards Black Hill, so we've now left the Jubilee Trail and we're now on the Hardy Way, which uh, is that 220 mile long distance path that winds its way through Dorset, uh, links places that had a connection with the author and poet Thomas Hardy. And it goes from uh, Higher Bockhampton, where he was born, to Stinsford Churchyard, where his heart is buried. We've made it to the top of uh, Black Hill and on the southern side there are some quite stunning scenes. 
and they really are quite breathtaking views, aren't they? Because a lot of the area around here um, is quite heavily forested. And then very far distance there's that ridge and on the other side, of course, the Jurassic uh, coastline. But in front of me, just here is this whopping great big stone. And I think it shows on a, an ordnance survey map as uh, a boundary stone. <laughs> and we know what uh, trouble we have finding those. But uh, it's known as the Devil's Stone or Five Fingered Stone. It's uh, five and a half foot tall and it relates to folk tales where well, the devil used to come here and have bets with people. Uh, he stated he could throw a rock further than anyone else. And they call it the five fingered stone because, well, it's the size of a child's hand being able to fit into the hollow on top and being able to, to drink water after rain. And it's very near the line of three Bronze Age barrows and, yeah, just a few yards further on I can make out on the um, top of the ridge there what looks like a Bronze Age barrow. Well, I don't know if we're actually going to be able to bag this as a, a trig point. Well, we're now heading eastwards uh, off Black Hill and just look at the size of these old abandoned pits. Now, I know there were some old brickworks up around these parts. Uh, there was a important part of the uh, local industry in the 18th century. I think the brickworks closed in 1911. site just in this uh, field next to me some deer I'll get my cannon out put the zoom on and see if I can get a slightly closer up picture but it might be a bit shaky and um, a bit grainy but I might see them a bit better <laughs> so peaceful now <laughs> this mound that uh, is in someone's back garden I wonder whether this is a, a barrow called the Hundred Barrow, a, a bowl barrow. It's 16 metres in diameter, 2.2 metres high, with a, well, it would have had a ditch around it. And its name reflects a site as a meeting or assembly place during the Norman and medieval period. Certainly on a ordnance survey map it uh, shows as being here. So well, this may well be it. One other little update on the route. Um, we've crossed over the road that leaves uh, um, Beer Regis to the south. Um, we had to sort of go alongside the road for a bit. There was just enough room on the verge, but it's quite a busy road. And now we're heading eastwards towards Dodding's Farm. Well, we're just about to approach uh, Dodding's Farm. As you can see, area of watercress beds. Now the farm itself dates back to the 13th century when it was known as Dodding's Beer. But watercress has been grown around these parts since the 1890s and there's some wonderful old pictures on the internet showing a, a little railway that they used uh, to collect the cress. Uh, just looking uh, this is the footpath that goes through the watercress beds but looking down here is that the remnants of the old little railway that they had in days gone by? I'm no expert, but it looks as though it could be. Oh yes, look at that crest down there. <laughs> looks good to eat, doesn't it? And how crystal clear the water is that uh, feeds it, that presumably must come off the, uh, the Beer River. Oh, 
lovely old buildings, part of Dodding's farm. Right, well we're now going to change direction on the homeward journey now, heading northwards back to uh, Beer Regis. <laughs> just as we're heading along this footpath uh, back to the village, just on the, the right there, up on the hill, that's uh, Woodbury Hill, and there's an Iron Age hill fort there that covers some five hectares. And I was reading that there used to be a big annual fair up there from the 12th century, right up until as recently as 1951. <laughs> I don't think uh, this footpath's been used that often recently but um, I mean it's fairly straightforward it's uh, it's not hard to get through but just adds to the adds to the fun of it all ah, this bit through here is okay well, just as we're coming back into Beer Regis I see our final destination the Royal Oak in the far distance but this field in front of me was uh, once the location of a manor house that was here in the Saxon period. And possibly Queen Elfrida stayed here at some stage in 978 AD. And it was enlarged during King John's reign, what was he, 1199 to 1216, uh, because the king and his court visited and stayed here 16 times. I guess they were here on hunting trips. And it became the residence of the Turbervilles when they took over the manor in the 13th century. Now, when it was sold to Henry Drax in 1733, he didn't live here and it gradually deteriorated. It was still here in 1803, but uh, had disappeared by 1844. There's, there's nothing left. I've seen a few pictures, an engraving from an earlier drawing and an ink drawing from 1786. Well, folks, we've come to the end of our walk. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up and a like and do leave a comment and do check out our Facebook page, Dave's Countryside Walks. We've had another super walk today. The weather has been fantastic and what a great place to end at the Royal Oak with a pint of Doom Bar. Oh, lovely. So until we meet again, thanks for watching and cheerio. Right, sir, is it uh, time for a crisp? Your favourite, Pipers. <laughs>